Okay, let's get down to uh, uh, to business. First of all, we'd like to thank our uh, co-sponsors who are, uh, guess what, the UCLA Canadian Studies Program, uh, the Wynas Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, and the Luskin Department of Public uh, uh, Policy. Um, we don't... We don't often hear about Canadian involvement in the Middle East peace process. However, Canada once played an important role in Israel-Palestine uh, peace building. Uh, I remember the players uh, who worked with us well, exchanging ideas uh, uh, and uh, at times uh, are working on our programs. Uh, and they even uh, wrote uh, for our book series with uh, Rulich. Uh, Michael Malloy, who you'll hear in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, was involved in three books on Jerusalem. And now let's turn to our moderator, Dr. Jeremy Wildeman, who is an analyst of global and Middle East politics, human security, and critical development, development aid. His specializations include the impact of foreign aid on the Palestinians and Canada's relationship with the Middle East at the universities of Exeter, Bath, and Ottawa, he has explored in depth the nexus of humanitarian de uh, uh, development, security, and peace building aid in the occupied Palestinian territory. He completed several major works on Canada's relationship with the Palestinians and Middle East. Dr. Willman has extensive field experience uh, delivering aid in the West Bank from 2002 to 2011. He is guest editor of the 2021 thematic special edition of the Canadian Foreign Policy journal, which I think you'll see in a few minutes, Canada's engagement with the Middle East peace and the Palestinians. So ladies and gentlemen, to begin our program, Jeremy Wildeman. Thanks, Professor Stegel. And I want to thank also uh, Manny Jad, Salome, Emily, Sasha, the rest of the UCLA CMED team, and of course, the sponsors you mentioned, uh, which uh, I won't need to repeat. I also want to thank my co-panelists. We have quite an esteemed uh, lineup of ex-ambassadors, and I'm going to mention to you that in Canada, we don't refer to uh, a former ambassador as ambassador anymore. They're just ex-ambassadors. But that being said, we have with us Andrew N. Robinson, a retired diplomat. His postings in the Middle East included Beirut from 1980 to 1982. He writes a little bit about that in the special edition of the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal, which we'll share with you later. He was the deputy head of mission in Cairo from 85 to 88, was ambassador to Jordan from 92 to 95, and there's many other roles. Uh, his assignments with external affairs have included director of the Middle East Relations Division from 1988 to 92, a very important period for that, uh, for Canada's relationship with the Middle East and the Palestinians. And, and in, you would say with Israel then, as part of that, and the Middle East peace process. Uh, he was also director general for the Middle East peace process from 1995 to 2000. In the latter capacity, he acted on behalf of Canada as a gavel holder, which is a term they created for chairperson of the refugee working group in the multilateral process of the Middle East peace process. He's authored articles about Canada's Middle East policy in the journal Refugee Studies in 1997, the International Journal in 2011, and the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal that I edited in 2021. Um, and and I, I'll just mention uh, uh, to Andrew, David, and Michael, as I mentioned your names, feel free to turn on your camera just so that everybody can see who I'm talking about. So there's Andrew. Uh, next with us, we have David Vibash who's a retired Canadian diplomat. He participated in the multilateral parts of the Middle East peace process as a member of the refugee working group and headed, the Canadian, and headed Canadian delegations to the environment, regional economic development, water and water resources working groups. Canada was very involved across these working groups. In the region, he served as head of the political section at the Canadian embassy in Israel from 1995 to 98. Uh, and this is prior to when, before Canada had set up a mission in Ramallah. Uh, where, where we have a representation to the Palestinians, uh, and that was set up in 1999. Uh, he, David was also ambassador to Libya from 2003 to 2006, and Canadian representative to the Palestinian Authority itself in Ramallah 
in that office from 2006 to 2008. Following retirement, he was involved in the Jerusalem Old City Initiative, which you'll hear about, and headed the Carter Center's Field Office for Israel and the Occupied Palestinian Territory, territory from 2011 to 2013. So we have David joined us now. And finally, we have Michael J. Malloy, or Mike Malloy. And he has 35 years of experience in international and refugee affairs. He was an advisor to the Canadian chaired Middle East Peace Process Refugee Working Group. Following direct, Director General assignments in Ottawa and Toronto, he was appointed ambassador to Jordan from 1996 to 2000 and was Canada's special coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process from 2000 to 2003. He was focusing on the Palestinian refugee problem in, 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 these, in, in that role. His post-retirement publications include three books with CMED on Jerusalem, Track to Diplomacy in Jerusalem, Governance and Security in Jerusalem, and Contested Sites in Jerusalem, and also Running on Empty Canada and the Indo-Chinese Refugees 1975 to 1980, and a, and a very important separate part of his career, Mike had to do with Canadian immigration and Canada's shift to a, a more multicultural society. So thanks for joining us. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, even though we are, I think we are up to 33 countries, uh, Manny mentioned to me, uh, participating, and I know we are uh, um, being hosted in UCLA, UCLA virtually, but I'm going to do something because it's going to relate to the broader moment in Canada. And this is something you'll be used to when you have, when you participate in a Canadian university seminar is to lead with a land acknowledgement. So I'm in Ottawa, Mike's in Ottawa as well. Andrew and David have spent good parts of their lives in Ottawa as well. So I want to acknowledge that we in Ottawa are located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. We recognize the Algonquins as the customary keepers and defenders of the Ottawa River watershed and its tributaries. And I'll say, if you ever visit Ottawa, you understand why this was a trading point with major rivers meeting together here. Beautiful rivers, wonderful to be on in the summer. We honor their long history welcoming, welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and uplift the voice and values of our host nation. Further, we respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. We will continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to the Indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples in what we now know as Canada, and is also referred to as Turtle Island, and fervently believe in the healing and decolonizing journey we all share together. So I'm going to mention that uh, why we are also uh, together is Mike, Andrew, and David all participate, all wrote articles in this, uh, you give me one minute when I pull it up, this Canadian Foreign Policy Journal special edition that, that was just published uh, with the help of Carleton University, it's specifically, it's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs program, uh, where we, we explored the contemporary Canadian foreign policy toward the Palestinians and the Middle East peace process. So we, we focused on it two separate eras almost, one where Canada was very involved as a, um, uh, in the political front as, a, as, as its old image as a peacemaker. And, and Canada was committed in that period to working with the international community and finding uh, a peace, helping to contribute to peace between Israelis and Palestinians. The journal also explores the change in Canadian foreign policy where Canada effectively abandoned that past approach. Um, so it's an interesting journal, I encourage you to read it, but we're gonna focus on this almost lost period that Andrew, Mike and David were involved in. And, and, and I mentioned that, I'll mention a couple of things related to this just before we head into their, um, opening presentations is, and, and one of the reasons I made sure to, uh, one of the many reasons to, to uh, provide the land acknowledgement is that in Canada, we're actually in a moment that you, that you in the United States, many of you are in the United States, have been in, in, in recent years of real questioning of who you are as a nation, what you are as a nation. And in our case, this is very much related to um, issues with race and identity, uh, Islamophobia has been very much an, a frontline issue recently, um, especially the uncovering of, of mass graves of, of children, uh, indigenous children at residential schools in Canada, but also in Canada's foreign policy. Uh, in 2015, uh, when uh, Justin Trudeau was elected, there was sort of a great relief in Canada where a, a lot of people thought 
uh, when he said Canada is back, Canada would return to its past Pearsonian foreign policy, which was um, essentially the idea was that Canada would focus more on peace building and building bridges in the world, including between the global north and global south. And this is a foreign policy that was largely abandoned in 2006 and was very prominently abandoned uh, in Israel and Palestine, where Canada started to take on a more partisan approach, but in the Middle East in general, where it started to take a more militaristic approach. And this is very different than the era that the ex-ambassadors were involved in, where their guidance was that Canada's priority should be to contribute to peace in the region. And this shift is, is, is really important to Canadians. So even though Canada, I think you can say about every country in the world, the focus of a public is on its domestic policies. In Canada, we have a unique situation where our identity was, we were basically British until the 1950s. And uh, we are very much uh, overwhelmed by our Southern neighbor and always trying to find our own identity. And that identity Canada found was actually found very heavily in the Middle East uh, in the Suez crisis in 1956, when Canada helped to broker peace after the British, uh, French and Israelis invaded Egypt and, and were caught with the United States and Soviet Union threatening them to leave. And for, out of this, we don't have time to get into this, out of this role, Canada developed this image as a peacemonger. And at the same time, Canada was very involved in helping to build and support the United Nations, uh, uh, United Nations and, interna and multilateral organizations generally. And a fo large focus of the United Nations has been on the Middle East and then on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, so with that being said, my long introduction, I would like to cede the floor to our ex-ambassador, Andrew Robinson. Okay, well, hi folks. And uh, first let me add to Jeremy's thanks uh, to the U UCLA Center for Middle East Development and also to Jeremy actually for helping to organize this event. So we could all come together and talk about uh, Canada's role in the Middle East particularly in the period uh, that Jeremy mentioned from about 1970 to 2000s. And uh, historically, uh, Canada, as Jeremy said, uh, was more sort of engaged in the Middle East via the UN, and we contributed uh, uh, to pretty well every UN uh, Middle East, uh, every peacekeeping force for the, for the UN. Uh, and there was generally a favorable attitude in Canada towards, uh, towards Israel. This, I don't want to say this changed, but in the 1970s, there was also a growing realization that to, to really have a peace in the Middle East, you had to have a, a proper Palestinian interlocutor. And although some countries were comfortable with uh, naming the PLO as their interlocutor, that... Uh, was not really the case in Canada for a while. Uh, and uh, uh, we were slower than others, but uh, mainly for internal political reasons, I would add. But uh, in 19, uh, 1980, this changed and the uh, government uh, decided to uh, send off a uh, 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 middle range diplomat to Beirut to uh, open a dialogue with the PLO. And actually I was that diplomat. And so, uh, and so there was a dialogue at sort of non lower than head of mission level with the, with the PLO uh, throughout the 1980s, first of all in, in Beirut. And then when the PLO had to leave Beirut in 1982, their headquarters left, then uh, it was conducted via Tunis or other, other embassies uh, in the region. And uh, uh, then uh, this, in 1989, the Canadian government uh, took this to uh, recognize the principle of self-determination for the Palestinian uh, people and uh, the idea that the PLO was their, uh, their representative. And, um, and so that actually clarified the, uh, the way. Um, and I wrote about this, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, in the article uh, in the recent uh, publication of the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Journal. I called the article, Talking with the PLO, Overcoming Political Challenges. 
So that was 1989. And then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, skip forward a couple of years, there was uh, the, the Gulf War kind of participated in the, in the forces uh, there to, to liberate uh, Kuwait. And then in that period following the Gulf War, there was real sense of optimism uh, in the international community that something would now be possible to be done on the Israel-Palestine file. And uh, indeed, the uh, United States uh, convened a Middle East peace conference in Madrid, which uh, uh, the regional parties were invited to. And uh, this was followed uh, in February, in January of uh, the year uh, 1992 uh, by uh, a multilateral conference uh, held in Moscow, which uh, to which a whole bunch of Canada and a whole bunch of European and other countries were invited, and which uh, uh, started uh, agreed to establish five working groups to promote uh, multilateral cooperation in the Middle East. And Canada was asked to take the chair of the refugee working group, which was probably the most the most political of the other of the working groups. Um, so there we were. Then uh, these uh, working groups, uh, we had a, the start was difficult. Uh, let me just put it that way. Israel boycotted the first meeting. They were going to boycott the second over the question of uh, the composition of the uh, Palestinian part of the so-called uh, Palestinian Jordanian delegation. And uh, the first gavel, Mark Perron had a lot of uh, very difficult challenges to overcome to, to get to the point where, where he did. Uh, finally, however, uh, the, the RWG was, uh, was going ahead. Uh, there's always the rule of consensus, which meant that uh, uh, it, it was not always easy to get agreements, but the work went ahead. In the first period, uh, there were some sig significant agreements, such as the closure of the Canada camp uh, in Sinai and the return of the families from that camp back into uh, into Gaza. And uh, there was some important work done on uh, family reunification as well. Uh, then, of course, in 1995, uh, there was the assassination of uh, of uh, the assassination of Rabin and the uh, uh, this made the made progress thereafter a bit difficult. We had a, a plenary in 1995 in December, but uh, there wasn't much possibility of uh, continuing uh, plenary meetings after that because of the deterioration in the peace process. And uh, uh, Canada wasn't willing to just uh, give up because for, for political reasons, both related to the region because we really did believe that encouraging dialogue between the Israelis and the Palestinians on the refugee question was important. That's number one. And uh, number two, having dialogue with the Palestinians people in the camps from the international, from the side of the international community was valuable. And number three, Canada also happened to think that uh, this was a bit of a feather in their cap, having, uh, having the chairmanship of such an important, uh, such a politically sensitive group. So uh, we had very clear instructions from the government to, uh, to make sure that we, uh, we kept the refugee working go group going, which certainly we didn't need very much encouragement to do. And uh, so in the next five years, basically, uh, uh, it, it didn't convene at plenary level, but we made a point of making sure that it continued its work through meetings of, of, of smaller groups, sort of a, a coordination committee of about 14 members. We had lots of uh, visits to by international delegations to 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 visit the, the refugee camps, whether in in uh, in the occupied territories or in Jordan. Uh, one of the um, uh, interesting things is that although Lebanon and Syria did not participate in the multilaterals, uh, they were also uh, they also agreed that uh, we could uh, uh, that we could um, have missions into into the camps of one kind or another to encourage dialogue, and this was very valuable, I believe. There were also some important uh, uh, humanitarian results, which uh, I don't have time to mention now, but uh, they actually. Uh, can be read about uh, in this uh, article that uh, is now up on the screen. Uh, 
uh, Canada's credibility as an actor in the Middle East peace process, the Refugee Working Group 1992-2000, which, uh, which, uh, which I wrote in 2011 and which uh, really covers this whole period that I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, but the bilateral process uh, uh, descended into difficulty and the multilaterals could not continue uh, uh, when the bilaterals were, were dead. So basically by the year 2000, uh, despite efforts at the last minute to revive them, uh, it didn't work and, uh, and the refugee working group basically ceased to exist after, after the year 2000. And um, so I think I would just say that in summary, there was Canada's engagement in the whole Middle East peace process in the Middle East was, uh, was uh, sort of uh, limited, but positively, oriented uh, in the first period with the UN, uh, with UN peacekeeping and Suez that Jeremy mentioned. Uh, then we, uh, we had a dialogue with the PLO. We uh, recognized Palestinian self-determination and, uh, and then we got invited to uh, lead the RWG and we continued that for eight, uh, eight years. Uh, and, um, and then they ended in 2000. So uh, with that, uh, I know time's short tonight, so uh, I pass back to you. And I'm sure that during questions, uh, there will be lots of other little uh, material which, uh, which can come out or will come out in the statements from the other uh, panelists. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Andrew. And on top of that, I'll just mention again, we're going to share the, the articles such as the two you've written that we've, we've flashed on screen during your speech. David. Thank, thank you, uh, Jeremy. Um, pursuant to, to Jeremy's introduction, I should note that I'm joining you from uh, Cologne and British Columbia, uh, a good portion of uh, the area where we are in, I should acknowledge, was also uh, the territory, the, it continues to be the unceded territory of our Indigenous uh, uh, nations in this part of uh, what we now call Canada. Uh, I could add that I also, I, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, which is in the, in the shadow of Detroit, Michigan. And uh, in fact, it's to the north of Windsor, Ontario. Uh, and that, so uh, I grew up in an environment which is very much aware of the important relationships between Canada and the United States. But turning now to the, uh, to the Middle East, uh, my thanks to uh, the UCA, UCLA Center for Middle East Development and to our moderator, Dr. Jeremy Wilderman for organizing this public webinar. It's also a pleasure to join with my friends and former colleagues, Andrew Robinson and Mike Malloy on this panel. Following a very rewarding assignment in South Africa, I returned to the headquarters of the Canadian International Development Agency in the summer of 1991. Under strong leadership from our prime minister, Canada played an important role in the campaign to end apartheid. Shortly after I returned to Canada, we received a memo from Andrew informing us of the launch of the Middle East peace process and inviting ideas on how CETA, our development agency, could support a government-wide response. At the time, I had no idea that the Middle East and the peace process would come to occupy a good portion of the remaining 17 years of my public service career. Let me mention a few key elements of the Middle East or the Madrid uh, peace process. In many ways, the process launched in Madrid in October 1991 was unique. It was sponsored by, it was co-sponsored by the United States and the then Soviet Union. The opening conference was a one-off event, immediately followed by an initial round of direct negotiations between Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation. It was held in Madrid, not New York or Geneva. The United Nations Secretary General was invited as an observer. Participation by states from outside the region was limited. Canada, for example, was not present uh, at the Madrid conference. In other important respects, the process was firmly rooted in the established framework for resolving the Arab-Israel conflict. 
It aimed to achieve a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace between Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and the Palestinians, based on United Nations Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, and the principle of land for peace. As outlined in the framework for Middle East concluded as part of the 1978 Camp David Accords, negotiations with the Palestinians would be conducted in phases with the objective of reaching an agreement on interim self-government within one year. Once agreed, interim self-government arrangements would last for five years with negotiations on permanent status beginning in the third year. These negotiations, too, would be based on Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. The same framework was replicated in the Oslo Accords and served as the basis for subsequent peace efforts under the Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama administrations. As discussed in my paper in the special edition of the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal, the Trump administration took its own approach to Middle East peace, one which ignored and actively undermined the established framework. Finally, the Madrid process provided for a parallel multilateral track. As noted previously, this was launched in Moscow in January 1992 and included the working groups that have already been mentioned. Uh, I participated, as, as was noted, I participated in the refugee working group team and uh, was involved in uh, three out of four of the other working groups. Uh, an Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs website commented on the distinction between the bilateral track and the multilateral track. It said, the purpose of the bilateral track is to solve the conflicts of the past. The purpose of the multilateral track is to build the Middle East of the future. A few words on my own involvement in the, in the multilateral working groups. From the, launch of, from the launch conference in Moscow in January 1992 until the signing of the Oslo Accords in August 1993, each of the working groups struggled with the same growing pains that we experienced in the refugee working group. This was primarily due to a lack of progress in the bilateral negotiations. The change of government in Israel, followed by the Oslo channel, energized the entire peace process. In Tunis, in October 1993, the RWG was the first working group to convene in an Arab country. Other working group meetings brought high-level Israeli delegations to Oman, Morocco, and other Arab states. In May 1994, Palestinian interim self-government was established in Gaza and Jericho. Later that year, Jordan and Israel concluded their own peace treaty and the first Middle East North Africa business summit was held in Casablanca. The pace of the multilaterals picked up further as the Oslo Accords were implemented. In September 1995, the Oslo II Agreement extended interim self-government to other urban areas in the West Bank and paved the way for the first Palestinian Authority elections in January 1996. Regrettably, this momentum was lost with the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin in November 1995 and the election of Benjamin Netanyahu as Prime Minister in March 1996. As Andrew noted and as Mike will comment, progress in implement, implementing the Oslo Agreement slowed to the point that the Arab League suspended participation in the multilaterals in 1997. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, and, and, and sort of this reminder and this run through of the, the, the many parts of the peace process that Canada and Canadians were involved in. Mike, we uh, hand the floor to you. There we go. Uh, to begin with, I have to apologize for something. They're changing the windows in an apartment two floors down from me, and I hope the grinding away of their uh, of their apparatus, whatever it is, that it doesn't interfere too much with what I have to say. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Jeremy for the opportunity to participate with Andrew and David in this event. It's really nice to be doing something again with Dr. Spiegel and my good friends in, in, at CMED. So how do, I'm, I, I'm an immigration officer by trade. So how was, did I get involved with the, with the Palestinian interest? In my career, I specialized mainly in refugee resettlement operations. I was involved with the Czechs, the Uganda Asians, and played a big role in the Indo-Chinese refugee resettlement in Canada. And I spent a lot of time helping to shape Canada's uh, overall refugee policy. However, assignments in Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, plus three years dealing with refugees at the UN in Geneva made me aware of the circumstances of the Palestinian refugees and their complicated relationships with the, the, their host governments and the way Palestinian, refugee, Palestinian issues and the refugee issue in particular tended to find its way onto the agendas of most UN and international organizations. In 1992, my refugee experience caught the attention of Barbara Gibson and Lucy Edmonds, Edwards, who were working uh, in the Middle East Bureau and uh, were uh, organizing for the first meeting of the refugee working group in Ottawa following the Moscow conference. I became the team's refugee policy advisor. And from the first meeting in Ottawa, David and I fell into the role of choreographing the refugee working group meetings by writing what was called the, the Gavel's hand, Handbook. Uh, in other words, his speaking notes. After the first meeting, I went to Europe to persuade the European Union, Norway and Italy to become what we called shepherds of the refugee working groups camp infrastructure, data collection, and public health themes, respectively. A Norwegian think tank called FAFO, headed by Terry Larson, uh, someone that uh, anyone involved in the peace process, uh, a, na a name we'll recognize, was carrying out the first in-depth survey of conditions in Palestinian refugee camps. So it was logical that Norway become our data shepherd and to debut the survey results at a refugee working group meeting which took place in Oslo about a year later. I participated in all of the re refugee working group plenaries after Moscow, including the first two meetings in Ottawa, meetings in Oslo, in Tunis, in Cairo, in Ta Antalya, and in Geneva. And uh, I did also attended a special family unification meeting in Tunis. I think this eventually contributed to my being appointed as uh, Canada's ambassador to Jordan in 1996, where I replaced uh, Andrew, who, who was going home to run the refugee working group. In Jordan, Palestinians made up half the population. Uh, and my responsibilities included uh, chairing a, a committee financing UNRWA. And of course, from Jordan, you have a front row seat as to what's happening on in, in, in Israel and the, uh, the Palestinian territories. So my education on this uh, subject continued. I returned to Canada in 2000, again to replace Andrew, this time as gavel holder. I reported to work the very day the second intifada broke out and the Palestinian and Arab countries walked away from the multilateral working groups, including the, re the refugee working group, leaving me with no, no place to wave my gavel around as gavel holder. Um, I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen next, but I was called to the prime minister's office. I was told that Canada's role in dealing with the Palestinian refugee issue was of great value to the government, and I should find a way to carry on. Andrew had done a fantastic job, I must say, setting up a scholarship program that benefited over 200 Palestinian women in uh, Lebanon, arranging for almost 500 families to, who had been stranded in, in, in Sinai for decades to return to ho new homes in Gaza, as well as uh, improving health access for P Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. However, his intensive work, his intensive diplomatic work to keep the refugee working group alive was no longer relevant and something needed to be done. So when in doubt, doubt consult. And I set off in the fall of that year to visit Russia, the United States, of the countries of Western Europe and the Middle East. I didn't find any uh, support at all for us withdrawing from the refugee issue. The Palestinians and Jordanians made it clear that they wanted Canada to keep working on the issue. Even the Syrians, who'd never attended a single refugee working group meeting or any of the multilaterals, including the uh, refugee working group, 
asked me not to close the file. A group of Arab academics I met at a meeting in, in the UK told me that the Middle East region was moving into a period of wasted time, but there was no reason that Canada should waste the same time. The Palestinian minister uh, responsible, Nabil Shah, took me by surprise after a meeting when he asked me at the end if I knew how the refugee problem could be solved. It was really clear at that point that while everybody knew by heart what uh, UN Resolution 194 had to say about refugees, no one seemed to have given any thought whatsoever to what actual solutions would look like. Even discussing related issues like resettlement or compensation were taboo. So I just at that stage decided I would follow the advice of my hero, Lord Nelson, never mind the tactics, tactics go straight at him. So that's what I did. The Swedish ambassador for humanitarian affairs told me, you're the Canadian foreign ministry. You can do things others cannot. Take the emphasis off development and focus on policy. Find a way to try and solve this problem. So that's what I did. We decided that the refugee working network as opposed to the formal meetings needed to be sustained. As the Tabatalks talk, were about to begin, we invited British, European and American partners to meet at our embassy in Washington. To our astonishment, they all showed up and it was evident they wanted a venue where discussions and coordination regarding the Palestinian refugees could take place. That morphed into something that we called, it had no name, so it was called the No Name Group. Uh, we also needed a private place to meet with Palestinians and Arabs and Arab authorities and scholars to continue refugee discussions. We gave $100,000 to Chatham House to start the meeting and were delighted to find that the EC immediately trumped us by donating 800 euros. That led to a, 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 an ability to meet two to three times a year at a wonderful place in the Cotwells called Minster Level. The Minster Level process had su a surprising impact on the attitudes of Jordanian and Syrian authorities uh, responsible for Palestinian refugees on their territories. In Canada, we brought together something called the Shinoa Group based on, on a, an Algonquin uh, uh, concept, which brought together the Foreign Affairs Department, the Canadian International Development Agency, the International Development Research Center, and a handful of academics to identify, coordinate, and set our priorities for refugee-related activities. Our combined focus was on encouraging people in the region to go beyond the resolutions and to begin to think through one, what a refugee agreement could actually look like. Two, how could it be presented to refugees and stakeholders? And three, how could it be implemented? That was the test we used when people came to us with projects. If it, if it answered one of those, need, one of those uh, priorities, we would find a way to fund it. By the end of the first year, we had a dozen uh, initiatives in play. We challenged Palestinians institutes to think seriously about what would need to be done if, for example, a million Palestinians decided that they wanted to return to the West Bank. I mean, what would you do? Got them really seriously thinking. We created a secretariat within the Palestinian Authority to coordinate the unit, uh, uh, four different units responsible for different, uh, different aspects of the refugee issue. We discovered that the International Organization for Migration in Geneva had extensive experience in uh, providing compensation to victims of displacement in the Middle East. We got them to assess the Palestinian situation, to train and brief Israelis and Palestinians, and to produce a book about how a compensation uh, regime might work. In my three years, we created an enormous amount of knowledge and we made sure that it was preserved. The question is, did it matter? And that's a question only history can judge. Thank you. So, for uh, modern observers, observers of Canada in the Middle East and Canada in Israel and Palestine, uh, it, it may come as a kind of shock, and especially as years go on, how involved Canada was at a policy and a political level uh, with many of the things that Mike, David, uh, the ex-ambassadors, Malloy, Vibash, and Robinson have shared with us. So I'm going to transition now to some questions that I came up with for them before we head into the Q&A. And I just wanted to note something special that that our three panelists provide with us is that firsthand knowledge from that era, that, that particular diplomatic era that they represent. Um, 
And, and again, they were contributors to this specific journal, which is also why we're all here together. So the first question I have, if you give me just one minute, is for David. Uh, so for an ex-ambassador, or in the U.S. terms, Ambassador Vibash, can you tell us a bit more about Madrid and Moscow? So a lot of people, uh, and even when I first began to learn about Israel, Palestine, the Middle East, I hear about Oslo, Oslo, and Oslo. But you've reminded us and me over and over again the importance of Madrid and Moscow. Can you tell us more about the importance of, of both those meetings and, and how did the then U.S. US USSR relations affect the early composure of the Middle East peace process. So we have to all remember that the Soviet Union still existed. Uh, and, and also we were just coming out of the, uh, uh, what um, some people refer to as the first Gulf War in, in where, with the, uh, where Kuwait was liberated from Iraq. So David, could you please go ahead? I'll, I'll take a shot at that, uh, Jeremy. Um, it was a very complicated time uh, and uh, uh, it's difficult to to find 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 the truth, uh, but um, there are a lot of there are a lot of details out there. But anyhow, by the time of the Madrid conference, President Bush, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and their foreign ministers knew each other pretty well. They'd been through a lot together. Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, which of course is very topical today, the fall of the Berlin Wall, German reunification nuclear weapons reductions, and the impending collapse of the Soviet Union. In the lead up to the 1991 Persian Gulf War, the Soviet Union did not stand in the way of the US-led coalition, coalition to expel Saddam Hussein's troops from Kuwait. This effort enjoyed widespread support from moderate Arab states, as well as Israel, which would later be targeted by Iraqi Sky missiles. The prevailing theory regarding the Madrid conference is that the goodwill generated by the coalition's victory provided the US with a unique opening to try to extend Arab-Israel peace beyond just Egypt. Another explanation detailed in a recent James Baker biography is that the conference idea had come from Gorbachev, initially as a condition of Soviet support for a US-led intervention in Kuwait. In this version of the story, the US understandably wanted to avoid any direct linkage, but agreed to take up the idea after Kuwait had been liberated. In any case, James Baker was back at his shuttle diplomacy within days of the end of the war. In the coming eight months, he would log over 250,000 air miles, lucky for him on his own plane, uh, traveling to 39 countries, including eight separate visits to the region. By late October, he had a deal and the invitations were issued. Co-chaired by Presidents Bush and Gorbachev, the conference opened on October 30th. It was the first time ever that Israel and all its Arab neighbors had come together in the same room. By the time of the launch of the multilaterals in Moscow, on January 28, 1992, and I had the pleasure of being there, uh, the Soviet Union had been dissolved, Gorbachev had resigned as president, and Boris Yeltsin had taken over as the president of Russia. Russia also assumed the role of co-sponsor of the peace process. One last quick note regarding Canada's role. Going into the Moscow meeting, our, expe our expectation was that Canada would be asked to lead either the environment or the water resources working group. We were not aware of plans to have a refugee working group and understand that this may have been decided on the spot in Moscow, perhaps as a compromise response to an Arab demand for a working group on Jerusalem. We also understand that Canada was the only country that was acceptable to all parties as Gava holder for the refugee working group. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. And I'm just gonna make a note because we're, getting, we're getting up to the Q and A soon. Um, and, and some people are already doing that. If you can, along with your name, add either your country of, of you can, uh, your, your home country or your affiliation, uh, we're gonna read out your name and that home country or affiliation along with your question. 
So that's coming along soon. Uh, I have another question now for Andrew, and I'd like to ask what kind of support did you have from the government of Canada? Was it high level support? And did you have the support from other governments? Andrew, you're on mute still, as always happens. <laughs> okay, uh, certainly we had uh, support from the government of Canada. There was a little bit of uh, concern on the ministerial level at first, uh, both from the point of view of what would this, how this would be, this be received in Canada by the domestic constituencies, either, either pro-Arab or pro-Israeli. Uh, and uh, also uh, there was a question uh, on the minister's mind uh, of, uh, well, uh, you know, does the, if we're in charge of the refugee working group, is this because they expect us to take the lead in accepting uh, Palestinian refugees? Well, never got that far. Um, but uh, there was consistent, the Canadian government, uh, once it got going, was very happy to, uh, to have the additional profile that, uh, that this provided because it meant also that our minister was the, a member of the uh, International Steering Committee for the multilaterals. So, for example, uh, he was in a front row or a second row seat uh, for the, uh, uh, the Oslo uh, the signing of the Oslo Accords in Washington, uh, which uh, which was uh, where there was also the Europeans uh, and the other chair of the uh, other working groups, but uh, not the French uh, foreign minister or the German foreign minister and others who were had to be further back because they weren't so involved in the process. So from the point of view of the Canadian government, this was uh, good news. Uh, from the point of view of other governments, uh, Certainly the United States was happy to have us uh, there and uh, I think they uh, trusted us and relied on us uh, and they were, uh, they were never really uh, not, uh, not supportive. The, um, uh, the, the Europeans always wanted to be a bit, act, a bit more activist than we could be and I remember in particular the uh, Ambassador uh, Moratinos who was the uh, uh, European Union uh, Ambassador for the Middle East who, uh, who was uh, pressuring me to do uh, uh, more. Is, and uh, if I, he, say, he actually threatened once that, well, if you don't do it, we will do it. Well, I can't even remember what it was, but I remember uh, that kind of reaction from him. Uh, the, on the other hand, the individual European countries uh, were all uh, quite supportive. And as, as uh, David mentioned, uh, they were, uh, a number of them served as shepherds, the Italians, the French. French did a good job on family reunification. Uh, the, uh, the Norwegians, the Swedes, and the Americans are also one of our uh, shepherds. So there was good, there was good support. Uh, and uh, this was never really, uh, never really an issue. Brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna only ask one more question and then we'll switch to question and answer. I know that uh, we had planned for more uh, uh, on our end, but uh, we're, we're, we're getting short on time. I'd like to let the audience have more time for questions. So um, I'm going to ask Mike, uh, if you could tell us uh, a, a bit about the quartet roadmap and about the uh, Jerusalem Old City Initiative. Uh, the latter in particular will uh, link in with some CMED publications. Thank you. Uh, one of the frustrations of this is that uh, we're, we're, we're being asked to compress complicated things that went on for years into a few minutes. So I'll, I'll talk as fast as I can on this. On the roadmap, I was halfway through my first round of, of, of consultations when I, when I first uh, succeeded uh, Andrew, and in fact, we were spending a, a, a rare down day in Paris of all places, when I got a call from uh, uh, our headquarters. Uh, and, when, and I was told to loop back, they wanted me to loop back to, to London to chair a very unusual meeting. The State Department had contacted our foreign ministry and told them that somebody had assembled a group of Israelis and Palestinians to talk about stopping the second intifada, which was at that stage in, at coming to the end of its second bloody month. Never clear why they asked us, but it seemed like a good idea, so we did. Our high commission in London had a great meeting facility and, let, and agreed to let us use it. I was very impressed with the Israelis arrived. 
and even more repressed, if I may so, say so, with the Palestinians. Not surprisingly, much of the first part of the meeting was take, taken up with mutual recriminations. But once it settled down, it was very obvious that while the two sides differed on an awful lot of things, they were both deadly serious about trying to get the violence stopped and the peace process back on track. We set up a second meeting a month later in Jerusalem. I had to put my foot down because they wanted to hold it on, uh, on uh, December 25th, which uh, turned out to be a holy day for me. Uh, but we had a meeting and it was, what I remember about it was how emotional it was. We're now, now almost four months into the Intifada. A lot of the, particularly on the Palestinian side, the, 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 the feelings were very raw. And the initiative kind of petered out after that. But about a year later, our foreign minister, John Manley, happened to be in Israel. It was at a, a dinner at which two of the Israeli participants were there. And they asked him to send me and my colleagues back to Jerusalem for meetings with the same Israelis and Palestinians. When, when Manley asked them why, and you may or may not like what I'm going to tell you, he was told the Americans tended to get too involved and the Norwegians were too preachy, but the Canadians just watched the soup and gave it a gentle stir when needed. So that gave me a clue as to how we were to um, manage this process. I chaired six or seven meetings in what we came to call the Mamilla process at Jerusalem's David Citadel Hotel over the next uh, six months, while the two sides negotiated what they called a uh, coordinated unilateral, a, a, a coordinated unilateral approach. In other words, the Israelis would, after some back, back channel discussions, the Israelis would make a, a concession the Palestinians would reciprocate, the Israelis would make another, the Palestinians would reciprocate, and little by little, the, the violence could, would be managed out. It's very interesting. The ideas came, interestingly enough, from the, from the Palestinian side, but they were really sharpened up and focused by the discussions with the Israelis. Uh, <clears throat> the, the final plan was to take, was to get the, the blessing of the Israeli and Palestinian authorities and then take the idea to Washington. Unfortunately, by the time we got to that point, Sharon was in charge. And I can only guess that from the Israeli, uh, our Israeli uh, participants uh, uh, came to the conclusion Sharon would never agree. And that was that. But subsequently, the lead Palestinian told me he was planning to take the ideas to Washington. So I got in touch with Assistant Undersecretary Bill Burns, who'd been my opposite number when I was ambassador in Jordan and urge him to meet this Palestinian man and listen carefully. So that was the end of it as far as I was concerned. But a few months later, the so-called Middle East uh, Quartet, which was the US, Russia, the UN and EU, announced the famous roadmap. And when I read the roadmap, I had an enormous sense of deja vu. I called up my Palestinian colleague and, uh, and he confirmed, hmm, there's an awful lot of the, uh, the uh, coordinated unilateral plan at the foundations of the roadmap. I don't take any credit at all for the ideas that came out of there, but I do create, take, take credit for the process that hatched them. Would you like me to stop there, Jeremy? I can talk about Josie if you want, but uh, I, I'll leave it to you. Uh, you know, maybe it's so important too, but let's let's take a few questions and maybe I can, I can loop back into Josie. And I also wanna share the books also that are associated with CMED. So um, let me take a question right now that I'll, I'll, I'll take these questions, I'll read them out and I'll pose it to all three of you. Uh, and the first one is, uh, and, and maybe you can uh, uh, just feel free to speak up whoever wants to answer first. Um, the first is from Ronan Hoffman from Israel. And, and, and his question is, how was the role of Canada in peace talks different than the role of the US and other facilitators? What were the unique aspects and elements in Canada's role? Thank you. So quite an interesting question. What differentiated Canada from other facilitators in the peace talks in your time? I'll start first. We were a bit player. We were not the main event. I think that's, that's the main one. Uh, we had a little bit, you know, and I, I think by that stage, it was pretty clear that there would be no peace agreement without the, um, the, without the indispensable American role but it was a heavy lift and they needed help. And I think that's how we saw ourselves as, as, as assisting the process. We believed in the need to bring about peace and we believed in the American lead, but we felt that we could, we could uh, be, be, very, be helpful 
by particularly by helping out with the with the multilateral talks. Andrew, David, do you have any thoughts? I think uh, Mike has uh, has said what needed to be said about that. Now, Jeremy, I guess the only thing I, I would add there and was that it, it became pretty clear pretty quickly after the Madrid process was launched that it was stuck. Uh, a good part of that problem was that the Palestinian representatives who were obliged to be there as part of a joint delegation with, uh, with Jordan, uh, they had no official representative capacity. Uh, they, they were a group of very well-informed and well-meaning individuals, but the real representatives of uh, the Palestinians were not at the table. And uh, thank, thank goodness for Oslo, uh, which addressed that problem and basically moved the process forward after a couple of years of wheel spinning. Thanks. Okay, another question that's come in is Jill Tansley from London, Ontario, which uh, you'll, our speakers will be familiar with. Um, Jill was actually working with the International Development Research Center in, with all three of you, I believe, at, at different points. And Jill was asking, what positive role could Canada play today in the Middle East peace process and what factors might prevent it from taking this? Can I uh, speak to that first? Or, and first to say uh, uh, how helpful Jill was to, to me personally, uh, uh, officially on, on so many occasions uh, in, uh, in working in this, uh, in this issue. She worked, she was with the IDRC, but she, was very much a part of the team. And, uh, uh, but I would say that uh, uh, what Canada can do now is still very much dependent on what other people are able to do. Because as, as uh, uh, David has, um, has mentioned, uh, and uh, Mike, uh, the, the, the big players have, meaning especially the United States, have to uh, have to be involved. It's difficult for to get something similar going now. Uh, and indeed, uh, given the sort of uh, uh, at least temporarily reduced uh, stature of the uh, of the United States relative to other developments in the world, we're not in the kind of unipolar world that we were in in the 1990s. Uh, it's uh, it's certainly going to be difficult to. Uh, to, to get something going unless it is, uh, has a broad umbrella uh, such as uh, the United Nations. Yeah, I think Andrew, well, first of all, lovely to hear, to, to hear your voice again, uh, Jill. It's, uh, she, was a, she was an important part of the team. Um, I, I think Andrew hit, hit it right, right on the nose. Uh, the, uh, We've seen instances in, in recent years where the Europeans have, uh, have sort of talked about getting together a conference out of their frustration with the, with, with the, with the lack of action from Washington, and that never comes to anything. The, the Amer American involvement was and is indispensable, and uh, if they choose to move ahead, we can really be helpful. We can be, uh, as we've shown, we have the capacity to do so, and we can certainly generate the will to do so. But um, Without that, uh, you, you, it's it's just waste, wasting time and effort. David, go ahead. Uh, I also had the great pleasure of, of working with Jill on, on this. And uh, in, in terms of what we can do, I think we need to speak up. Uh, for some reason, on this particular issue, Canada hasn't had the voice that we would like it to have. We tend to be in responsive only mode. Um, there was 
at, at the time at the time of the recent uh, outbreak uh, involving Gaza, uh, there was a reference to diplomatic laryngitis, uh, and and I, I think that was a very good reference. And Joe knows where it came from. Um, we tend we tend to keep our heads down for, when it comes to the Israel Palestine issue. We went through a period with a conservative government. Uh, before uh, our, our current government with Mr. Trudeau. Um, many of us were hopeful that when Mr. Trudeau came in, um, our, our, our approach and our voice would be louder. Uh, that hasn't been the case. I think on this particular issue, uh, and contrary to what our prime minister uh, indicated in his first election campaign, uh, Canada is simply not back. Uh, the whole process is in a stalemate. And uh, I think we need to work with other actors to try to uh, resolve that and, and move from conflict management mode to some serious effort at conflict resolution. Thank you. So I'll just note that Jill worked for the uh, International Development Research Center, again, IDRC, which uh, is an arm's length uh, government agency, which is very much an expression of Canada's old uh, Pearsonian uh, foreign policy identity. And, and it's dedicated to research related to uh, international development and peace. And uh, Jill actually worked with the son of, 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 of Pearson as well. Um, the RDSA played an important role. It isn't part of government technically, but played an important role throughout all of Canada's active period in the peace process. Uh, so another question I'm going to ask, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit here. It, um, sorry, da uh, a name you'll be very familiar with, Daniel Kurtzer from the United States. Uh, why cannot Canada build a coalition of willing countries who have good relations with both Israel and the Palestinians to move something forward? Why wait for an unwilling US, for an unwilling US administration? I noticed that uh, Dan is a, a, a well-known baseball fan and he's very good at throwing curves. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, it takes political will and we don't have it at the moment. And I, I, I think that uh, we're going, we are going through a period. Uh, we have a lot, as, as was mentioned earlier by Jeremy, we have a lot of big, difficult internal issues uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, the Western United States is on fire and, and, uh, and uh, my friend David is, 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 is sitting within miles of, of, of enormous fires in Canada. Uh, and that's just one of, one of many issues that, are, that are, we're, we're having to deal with right now. But I, I think we ignore it at our peril. And I think we ignore, ignore it at Israel's peril. Uh, things are not, are not getting easier or simpler in, in, in the Middle East. And... Uh, the American uh, retreat from Afghanistan will be misinterpreted by all sorts of people. And I, th I think that there is, it, it, it probably would be something our government could do, whether, whether they would think that, that, there's, that there's sufficient uh, political gain from it domestically, I don't know. But nice to hear from you, Dan. Anybody else have any thoughts on, on that? And, and that relates to one of the moderator questions I put to the shelf, actually. Maybe, maybe I could come in on that too, to say uh, it really is a question of, uh, of, well, two parts. First of all, Canadian political will. And I, uh, like Mike, don't really think that uh, in Canada right now, uh, despite uh, Mr. Trudeau's uh, uh, statements. Uh, I don't really think that uh, we're going to see that kind of uh, political uh, uh, will to to get out there in front and say, "Hey, you uh, Germans and French and uh, British and Japanese, uh, uh, come on, get on board with us. Let's do something uh, positive here." I don't think there's the there's the will really to uh, to to have that kind of uh, involvement on 
on this particular issue, which uh, at least as far as the uh, American administration is concerned, seems to be seems to have been moved to a back burner. And, uh, and so, you know, I think the Canadian government isn't going to uh, be trying to move it up onto, um, onto a front burner. So I think, uh, I think that's the, the, the big challenge. Thank you. And do you have any thoughts, David? Dad? I, I guess only uh, only to add that if if Canada hasn't taken on that kind of a role in the past, it's in large measure due to the fact that there hasn't been the space. I mean, we've always deferred to the United States to 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 take the lead on this, and I guess the the open question now is. Uh, is President Biden going to, to pick that up? Um, I, I think after the, uh, the meeting with uh, Prime Minister Bennett last week, uh, that's still very much a, an open question. Where does the United States intend to, uh, to take this issue? Are we going to move beyond conflict management? Thank you. Uh, so another uh, familiar name for uh, a number of you, uh, Ferry de Kirkhova uh, from Canada was asking when reflecting as you all do so brilliantly, is there any surprise in the total silence of the Biden administration during Prime Minister Bennett's visit about Palestine? And if the deafening silence of our, and, and anything about the deafening silence about our own government right now. So best from Ferry. It's not just Dan that throws curves, I gather. Hi, Ferry, how are you? Uh, I, I think in the, you know, the, the government is in the middle of an election. And so we can't, we can't expect that, that there will be, there'll be too much uh, done here. There's, you know, there is, uh, we have a very important Jewish community in Canada that is very, very pro, much of which is very, very pro Israel. We have a large and growing Arab and Muslim population. And so the government has to calculate very carefully what, what kind of how, how, what kind of foot, foot it puts forward when it comes to the Middle East. Um, I think they were very the previous governments were very comfortable with what we were doing with the refugee working group, even though it was potential there was a potential there to really blow up in our faces. But uh, but those of us who managed it were very aware of that. We're very, very careful with, with what we did. We were, we were very adventurous in some ways, but we were always adventurous. We were only adventurous when we knew there were no landmines in the areas we were working in. So I, I, I think there's a, there's a, uh, there, there's no appetite right now. Uh, can I come in now on that? Because uh, on the one hand, I agree with Mike that uh, there is, certainly no appetite during the election campaign and probably not afterwards as well on the part of uh, the uh, uh, political uh, elite in Ottawa. On the other hand, uh, the situation has really uh, changed uh, since, uh, since the 1990s. And uh, when at that time uh, we, could, uh, we could really uh, uh, believe that, uh, uh, that there was a, a a commitment on both sides to uh, to try to put meaning both Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians to uh, to try to get to a resolution of this uh, that was based on the two state solution. Uh, we don't see that anymore, and uh, maybe the time has come for Canada to uh, to be a little bit more forthright. Uh, we've uh, we've perhaps had enough of people. Uh, uh, um, ministers saying on the one hand, uh, reiterating our, our, our long-standing uh, policy and then turning around into maybe a different forum, uh, talking about uh, shared values with Israel and, uh, and uh, Israel even, they, uh, speaking of Israel as our ally. I think that uh, the uh, information which uh, is increasingly available now about the abuse of uh, human rights uh, 
by the Israelis, both in the occupied territories and uh, we've seen uh, some reports by uh, Israeli and other human rights groups like Bet Salem uh, about, uh, uh, about the situation in, the, uh, in Israel as well. Uh, we've seen, we've heard observers talk about, uh, dis describe uh, uh, Israel's uh, actions and their policy towards East Jerusalem as ethnic cleansing. Uh, these are pretty strong, pretty strong words. And it seems to me that uh, uh, Canada needs to uh, speak out a bit more and a bit more consistently instead of just saying here on the one hand this and on the other hand that. Uh, it's time to speak up and maybe even to start looking at uh, at what Canada can do to uh, uh, to reflect our displeasure. Thanks. Okay, thank you. David, do you have anything quickly to add? I, I, I think that's, that's, that's been covered. I, I guess the only quick point I would make is Mike mentioned the roadmap for peace. To my recollection, that was 2002. It's 19 years ago, folks. Uh, I see that there was a, uh, the, the quartet, the quartet, I was surprised to learn that the quartet actually continues to exist. Uh, but it seems that they did have a virtual meeting uh, uh, in March. Um, what's going to come of that? And I guess my worry is that, you know, as nice as it was to see President Biden reaffirm uh, his view that uh, the two state solution is the only viable approach. Um, it's not producing any results. Uh, and I, I think it's almost become code uh, for the status quo. And the status quo, as we saw in May, uh, is very uh, volatile. Thanks. Uh, and now I have another quest question. This is from Samir Shawa. I hope I'm, Samir, I'm getting that right. I remember uh, Samir says, I, uh, oh, and Samir's from Palestine. Uh, I remember Canadian uniform forces stationed in Gaza uh, from 1957 for about 10 years. There are now there is now Canadian involvement in the Sinai. There is over 1 million refugees in Gaza. Can Canada help in lifting the siege on, on, these, on, on these people in, in the pe on the people in Gaza? And I, I think Samir is referring specifically to the refugees, but maybe to Gaza generally. So in other words, what role could Canada play with Gaza as we see it today? And, and so I, I know I'm trying to focus sort of on, on that previous period, but we, we had, did tie in a bit with Canada camp and I just wonder if you have any thoughts and this relates to going forward. Well, can I uh, just say briefly, first of all, that uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, forces still in the uh, MFO in the Sinai, although that's not a UN operation. And, uh, uh, but it's, uh, um, the siege on Gaza certainly should be lifted. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there need to be ways found to uh, to manage that lifting, but it certainly needs to be lifted. And uh, uh, this is a matter which I think uh, uh, Egypt has a role to play in. As uh, we were just uh, we just had our former ambassador to Egypt uh, on the line as well, and uh, and certainly uh, he might have he might have had some thoughts on this, but. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I don't see any uh, specific role for, for Canada in that regard. If you don't mind, I'm going to... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Mike go no, ahead. I'll, no, I'll let you no, respond. No, no, I was no. going to say we, ha we have a specific question for you, Mike, actually. No, no. Uh, and I'm going to try and just move things along, get in as many questions as we can before we, 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 we have to go. Um, and this is from Anne, and I'm so sorry as I get every name wrong, I'm sure. Uh, and trust me, it happens to me all the time. Uh, Anne Moisan or Moisan. Oh, yes. Um, from, okay, so you know each other personally, um, from the United States. Uh, and, and, and Anne is asking, with your extensive experience and practical work on refugees, so just tying into that refugee question that uh, Samir te teed up for us, how should the international community move forward as the issues of refugees, asylum seekers, IDPs has become more complex, intertwined, and seems to have outgrown the... Uh, 
the existing one on the or, or existing books on guide guidance books, I should say. What constructive role could Canada play? Well, uh, this goes way beyond uh, what we're talking about here. Nice to hear from you, Anne. Uh, we used to have breakfast together at, at, at a meeting that we used to attend together. Uh, the, uh, I, I think the, the one of the, uh, there's 60, 60 million refugees and, and displaced people, not counting what's going to be coming out of Afghanistan. That's, you know, if, 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 if they all lived in one country, it would be one of the larger countries in the world. Of displaced people, uh, in the uh, and and during the the Trump uh, era, we discovered that uh, all of a sudden Canada was the largest resettlement uh, uh, country in the world, uh, and we, we're taking in people at a rate uh, at a sustained rate that that far outstrips anything that we were involved in when when I was uh, involved with those things. I think there's the, the one thing with that, uh, there's always been this notion that there's, there's three solutions for refugees. One, one is, uh, they stay where they are and maybe they get integrated and maybe they don't. One is that, uh, when conditions are right, they, they get to go home in safety and dignity. And the third is that, uh, we pick them up from wherever they are and we take them to the United States or Canada or Australia or France or some other country willing to take them in. The 60 million people out there, I think that those parameters are, are no longer all that, all that uh, uh, useful in terms of thinking of it. There's just too many people. And uh, we, we need to be thinking more in terms of alternate ways of, uh, of uh, alternate pathways for refugees. But also, we also need to think about the fact that uh, we think about refugees, oh, well, there'll be a burden on the country that takes them in. Uh, the Canadian experience is, yeah, they, they are a burden for about 18 months. And after that, they become taxpayers. And after that, they begin to contribute. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, you just have to let, take a look at our, our major cities in Canada and increasing our smaller towns to find refugees running businesses and in, and in, 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 in teaching and institutions and various other things. You know, refugees, refugee status, we hope, is, a tem is something temporary. And... Uh, I, I think uh, one of the one of the problems that the, it, it, we're also facing more xenophobia and anti-migrant rhetoric and 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 conflating refugees, uh, including Palestinian refugees, with terrorism, which which is simply not the case. There, yes, there are bad people everywhere, including people born in Canada, uh, occasionally go, go go off track. So, if you can believe that, amazing, eh? Uh, so, I I think that there the uh, there, there has been one of the big positive steps in recent years was the Global Refugee Compact, which was not necessarily convention, but had some really useful ways of thinking about refugees and useful ways of focusing our attention on not just the refugees, but, the, but also the, the communities that are impacted by them. And uh, I mean, in, in, in the Canadian system, We've always looked at refugees and said, "Yes, they're in need, but we're gonna we go. Oh, we can only move the ones that are that are going to be that can land on their feet within a year." With the Syrians, the, the government took a different attitude and asked the UNHCR, "Give us the one third of the of the uh, of the population in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey who are the most vulnerable, who are the least qualified." And we picked them up and brought them to Canada and matched them with sponsors and matched them with our really powerful institutions for settling people. And my goodness, five years later, you'd be amazed how those vulnerable people are doing. So I think I think one of the things is we uh, we say, oh well, we're we're being overrun with them. You know, Turkey's got three million Syrians still on not on their doorstep in their in in their country, and they're now faced with with masses of people coming uh, coming across the border from Afghanistan if if the opportunity arises. So I think I think the Western world once more has to wake up to the fact that we're we're privileged in many ways, and we need to start throwing both opportunities and more money at the problem. Okay, I'm going to do my best. We only have a few minutes. We have a lot of good questions and some questions I'm very much going to apologize that are from earlier that we're trying to get to as well, uh, including I had to ask it uh, just to rephrase the question or what your um, country was. Uh, so Samir Altaki uh, from Syria, the UAE and United States, uh, you have a longer question, uh, Samir, uh, 
or Samer, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which you prefer. Uh, so I'm just going to ask very quickly uh, um, a question he has about the past. He's cur uh, they're currently working on uh, some research centers in Israel about what went wrong with the peace process. And from the Israeli and, and Syrian side, they have a pretty clear idea. From your point of view, what went wrong uh, with the peace process? Oh, and I think uh, Samir might be, uh, uh, sorry, I'll just add, and why, why either at the level of the international climate institutions, what went wrong with Syria and Israel? I'm ready to say something on that, uh, not so much about uh, uh, Syria and Israel, uh, but uh, what went wrong with the peace process. And uh, basically uh, what went wrong was with it was that uh, uh, there was no longer a appropriate partner on the Israeli side. After uh, 1996, uh, uh, then um, uh, the Israeli government, although it, uh, it spoke about wanting to uh, to have a, a resolution, uh, they certainly, as far as the refugee working group was concerned, uh, uh, were not uh, were not willing to be a, an active partner. Were not willing to see a, 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 a resolution, and indeed, uh, were not willing to. Uh, 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 to explore other opportunities which were offered uh, as alternatives to the refugee working group to try to uh, uh, resolve uh, the, uh, to explore uh, ways to resolve the situation after 1996. So I'm gonna ask only one final question uh, that, that closes out as we also close the session. I'm gonna really apologize to everybody else because we have, and we'll answer some of them. I'm sorry to Mohammed and Jaya and others as uh, maybe we get to you somehow still before this closes. But Peter Jones has a very relevant question. Uh, I'm gonna flash a few images of books to, to, to take in consideration, um, including our, our journal and just the, the series of books about Jerusalem that we didn't even get to bring up the Jerusalem Old City Initiative that, that uh, CMET was involved in with, 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 with the Canadians. Um, Peter Jones, uh, which you all know from the University of Ottawa and, and formerly DFATE has a question. If the two state solution is dead, a proposition he does not necessarily agree with, but hears often, what is the next role for Canada? Uh, Canada is uh, uh, the host of something called the Forum of Federations. And uh, uh, certainly uh, there is room for a lot more uh, ex exploration of different forms of a one state solution that would respect the different, uh, uh, di different uh, cultures in different areas. And uh, we have uh, uh, one of the most decentralized federations in, in Canada. Uh, the idea of having a, a, a federation uh, of some kind in uh, the uh, whole territory of Israel-Palestine uh, is uh, anathema to, people, to some people on both sides, but it may in fact be the only, only route out and more work needs to be done to explore that. And I would encourage the Forum of Federations uh, to uh, encourage the Canadian government to, uh, to encourage the Forum of Federations to, uh, to do a lot more work in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Mike or David, do you have any thoughts? Go ahead, David. What I what I would let, let me put let me put in a plug for a recent report by the International Crisis Group, which is called Beyond Business as Usual in Israel Palestine. It came out on the tenth of August. Uh, that report very clearly recognized that we are in a stalemate situation and that simply repeating the, the two-state solution mantra is not going to take us forward. And uh, the points that they made there, and it's, it, it, it's, it's a very detailed report and I recommend it to everyone, but the points they make down there, that the, there is that the, the first thing that we need to do is take steps to lower the temperature. 
especially uh, in terms of, of what we see or what we saw in May uh, in, in, in Jerusalem, I might mention, and in Gaza. Uh, and then they go beyond that to say, uh, and, and in terms of lowering the temperature and for the questionnaire that we had from Gaza, uh, one of the things they emphasize is that we have to find some kind of a way uh, to end uh, the blockade that's going on there. And perhaps it's conditional on the performance of, of, uh, of uh, those who are launching rockets towards, uh, towards Israel. Uh, but uh, that's one thing that needs to happen in the first instance. Uh, beyond that, uh, according to this ICT report, uh, they say we, we, we need to look at uh, Palestinian reconciliation. Uh, we need to look at quartet conditions. Uh, to my, in my experience, this whole thing broke down in 2006 with the election that President George W. Bush wanted to happen. Uh, it happened. Uh, the international community did not like the results. And therefore, the Palestinians were, declined, were, were denied any kind of democratic means to resolve their differences. And what happened in 2007 uh, you have a war between Fatah and Hamas, and here we are in 2021, we're in the same situation. Uh, that's, uh, that situation has to be resolved. Part of that resolution is for the Palestinians to move towards elect elections, and uh, that, that almost happened, or that was going to happen in May, and uh, as we saw, uh, uh, President Abbas uh, brought a stop to that. Uh, so the, 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 the status quo is not sustainable. We need to find ways of, of moving away from that. Thanks. Mike, go ahead. And, and by the way, we've been given uh, an extra 10 minutes to make use of. So uh, if, if you don't mind staying on, there's a few more questions. I, I think one of the things that well, I, I agree with, with what's been said and uh, the, the ICG reports are always worth looking at because they're so, they're so grounded in something similar to common sense. Uh, but I think there's a, uh, one of the things that needs to be done, I think is to uh, do a little bit more work on on uh, explaining and, and to the people in the in 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 Israel and Palestine just where the current uh, the status quo will ultimately lead. Uh, we 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 have seen just how dangerous it it is uh, with uh, with with Hamas and uh, and Hezbollah armed to the teeth uh, with uh, with all sorts of things that can do real damage in, in the region. Uh, to to Israel and to any and to anybody who's any bystanders, uh, and I think there needs to be some 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 serious discussion about you know, I mean I see in some right wing uh, 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 publications coming out, out of Israel, all you know people talking about the next war and how complicated it's going to be and how we have to prepare for it. I think the next war is something we should be thinking about avoiding, not winning. Uh, because with you know one of the one of the sad things about uh, about war is so you can you can you, you can people people learn more from war than anything else and we see at every turn it gets harder and harder for military dominance of Israel to actually work in the mountains of Lebanon and other places uh, and uh, uh, I, I think this the situation at the present time is more dangerous from Israel than many people there realize. And we need to be, make sure that, that people begin to understand that. And, and also, we need, we need to explore the one state solution because we have to demonstrate, if nothing else, that it's not where near as good as a two state solution in terms of meeting people's the aspirations, uh, the aspirations of both sides. But, you know, it, in many ways, the stalemate, such as it is, or the status quo, obviously serves purposes of, of, of a lot of people, uh, but it's paid for an absolute misery on the other side of the line. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So uh, I, I'm just going to quickly mention a couple of things at leading into a, 
the question I, we brought up now also different forms of, of, of final status agreements, right? Uh, which still hasn't been resolved, right? One state, two state, what type of federation, if there's a federation. Uh, I just wanna add related to war and conflict that in, in 1979, Canada was one of the early Western countries to try to move its, uh, or it, it considered moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, it was a, a short-lived uh, conservative Joe Clark government who, who uh, had pledged that in, in his uh, electoral platform. And it led to a huge backlash from the Arab world, uh, particularly led by Saudi Arabia, which forced Canada to, to explore how it looks at the region. And they actually sent another former conservative leader out across the region called Robert Stanfield, um, who uh, was uh, never got to be prime minister, but kept losing to the current prime minister's father in elections. Uh, he came back with a report very quickly saying that uh, Canada should actually focus on peace building in the region. So I'm just relating that to what Mike said. And this sort of, this report in 1980 uh, set up a lot of how Mike, David and Andrew were, were directed. And, and you know, there's a lot of reasons, but Canada was sort of focused on in, in their era. That being said, and I brought up Jerusalem on purpose as well, uh, I do have one question because Ch Chaya, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, has been asking, uh, trying to get this in for quite a while. And I'm gonna abbreviate a bit and, and loop it into something. Has there been any attempt to reach out to the leadership of Hamas and try to pressure them to accept international agreements to recognize and accept Israel as a legitimate entity in the Middle East? Um, and I'm gonna very quickly note then that can Canadians are not actually allowed to deal with Hamas. I'm also going to, add that I just a question like uh, how did Canada react to the growth of Hamas in the 1990s? Jeremy, I might, I might just mention that the ICG report that, that I referred to uh, a, a moment ago um, I'm sorry, I, I I lost my train of thought. Maybe it will come back to me. Just a, just a moment. No worries. And and maybe even you can, uh, as I mentioned, Canadians just are not allowed to deal with Hamas. So uh, and, and very few Western uh -huh. officials are. Uh, so there's it's not really possible to interact with them. But maybe even focusing on like how did Canada react to the growth of Hamas, and then I'm going to loop back into something about Jerusalem as we run out of our last time. Sorry, go ahead. You know, remind me, in that ICG report, uh, one of the things that they suggest is that perhaps the quartet should revisit uh, the quartet conditions, which, of course, uh, were a good, part, a good part of the reason for the split between Fatah and Hamas, uh, that uh, people, uh, people obviously have different views on the approach to, to the peace process. Uh, Hamas didn't agree with some of the elements of the quartet conditions, and uh, that fundamental difference has underlined, underlined uh, the, the split between Fatah and Hamas that continues, continues to this day. What the, court, the ICG report suggested was that we should look for ways, uh, look to the quartet, perhaps for ways to, uh, to modify the, their conditions such that perhaps we could find, uh, find a way to move towards a, a unity government. Uh, and that uh, I happened to be, I, I was the representative to the Palestinian Authority at the time of the 2006 elections. Uh, as soon as those elections took place, we were instructed not to deal with any of the Hamas representatives, uh, even though most all of those representatives were not officially card-carrying members of Hamas. There were people who were sympathetic to Hamas, but they they were not, they were not specifically Hamas representatives. Uh, so. Um, what happened is there were efforts towards unity government and those efforts were always resisted. Uh, what the ICG has suggested is perhaps we should make it, we should try to facilitate uh, a mechanism whereby the Hamas point of view on this could be resolved between Palestinians through some kind of a democratic process uh, rather than what we've seen in the last, uh, in the last uh, 14 or 15 years. Thanks. Thanks, David. I, uh, very quickly, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Just uh, quickly on that. Uh, uh, first of all, we uh, 
we talked to the PLO for many years uh, when there was still a lot of issues about uh, various parts of the PLO uh, conducting uh, terrorist type of attacks, including the, the Achille Lauro and uh, the hijacking of the Achille Lauro uh, ship uh, in 1985 uh, uh, or six around there. And, um, you know, uh, Winston, and, and now just having listened to David, uh, we also know, of course, that uh, Canada, not only do we not talk to Hamas, but we don't talk to, uh, to Tehran and we broke off uh, relations uh, uh, with Israel and uh, closed uh, our embassy there. Well, you know, Winston Churchill famously remarked uh, uh, that jaw jaw is better than war war. And, uh, you know, it's much better to talk than to fight. And uh, if, you know, if we're not talking to these groups, even if you disapprove of them, you don't have to, with the PLO, we didn't uh, talk at the ambassadorial level for a long time, but we were still talking and listening and, and uh, you know, and MPs would come and talk to them, even though our ambassador couldn't. And, uh, you know, that, that should be going on too, including uh, by Canadian members of parliament who, who need to get up a bit of gumption and say, we've got to, we've got to do this sort of thing. And I mean, both with Hamas and with, uh, with Iran, especially given the, the way the, uh, the uh, larger Middle East is changing right now with in, in Iraq and so forth. It's, uh, there's important developments going on there and we, we shouldn't be limited in what we can, in who we can talk to about them. Thank you. I'm gonna add, uh, Andrew, that 1% of all Canadians are of Iranian heritage. Um, so we, we're really out of time, but uh, so thank you to C UCLA for hosting us. I just wanna give 60 seconds if we can, a 60 second mic reply, what the GOCI was, because this is important also to the link to CMED. Okay, uh, thank you. The, the Jerusalem was maybe, yeah, am I, am I on? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, yeah. The Jerusalem City, uh, City Initiative was, was something that, uh, my colleague, the late Michael Bell, and another colleague, uh, John Bell, no relation to Michael, decided to do when, when we uh, retired because we thought, wouldn't it be fun to do, to touch and work on something that no Canadian government in its right mind would ever let us touch? And we, we couldn't find anything better than Jerusalem to do it for. Uh, the, we, we ran an eight, uh, eight year process looking at the possibility of finding a way, a governance structure for the old city of Jerusalem that would allow both sides to have a say in its governance by uh, uh, essentially creating a board chaired by the Israelis and Palestines, but, but, but staffed with, 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 by other countries friendly to both and uh, to, to oversee a, 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 a third party uh, governance structure in the old city that looked after those things that caused the trouble in the old city. And, but designed in such a way as not to get the, between the, the inhabitants and their governments. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's quite complicated and takes much more time. It, interestingly, uh, our, our ideas were used by Omar in his, in, in his negotiations with, uh, uh, with Abu Mazen and we know for a fact that when Mr. Kerry made his last effort to get things started with the Netanyahu government, uh, uh, he had our papers in his briefcase. So uh, I would commend this to you. It's, it, it's uh, the, uh, uh, the, the main book is the one uh, uh, called Track to Diplomacy, which actually explains what, we, what, what it was that we we had in mind. The other two are our research papers that that that, that uh, informed our thinking. Thanks. Sorry, I took it down early, Mike. Professor okay. Spiegel, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Wow, such an important uh, series of discussions, not just years gone by, but uh, it kind of to remind us of different types of approaches that could be used uh, on the Arab-Israeli scene and that so many have to some extent forgotten, given it up, uh, ignored. So I feel this was such an important uh, session and a chance to get back to so many friends. 
both um, on the podium, so to speak, as well as uh, part of the uh, audience. So it was so meaningful for, for me. And on behalf of the team, I want to thank, uh, uh, thank you all uh, and thank our Canadian uh, colleagues. Uh, this was a marvelous discussion and, uh, and should be continued, especially this whole position of what could be done. It's not just a question of looking back but looking uh, uh, to the future. Uh, and now, uh, as we always end, the CMIN has uh, many exciting programs being planned in the coming months. We're trying to adjust to uh, 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 the events of Afghanistan, uh, how it, these events will affect the entire Middle East. And you should be hearing uh, from us uh, very shortly. Uh, very shortly about these uh, new programs that we are developing. Uh, if you are interested in learning more, sign up for our mailing list uh, that's now on the screen uh, and uh, uh, also in the chat window. Um, so uh, it's a little painful to have to say this, but to, goodbye to everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day or have a good night's sleep, depending where you are. And we look forward to uh, seeing our Canadian friends again soon uh, and to uh, being able to provide all of you uh, literally in the next few days, some information about uh, where we're going from here in September. Thank you all. Thank you all those who uh, prepared uh, this meeting, uh, the people in the back scene who made it all possible. And I will say to you all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.